All right. Let's pray and we will start. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be together, to be in your word, to be in your presence. And Lord, we ask for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to open our hearts, to open our minds, so that we can understand, we can receive these truths. And Father, even as your word is being ministered, we pray that the Holy Spirit will work in our lives, bringing uh, an expression of your word, making your word good in our lives, that we can walk in your truth, we can walk victorious, we can walk in everything you've provided for us. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, very quickly. Uh, we'll uh, revise some memory verses, and then we will get into our lesson. Uh, I just want to do this very quickly. So Romans, sorry, First um, Corinthians chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen. Anyone online wants to do that? First Corinthians three, sixteen and seventeen. You want to unmute your mic and say it. First Corinthians three, sixteen and seventeen, uh, without looking in the Bible. All right. <laughs> Let us say it by memory. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Anyone online students you want to unmute and say it by memory? Okay, nobody online wants to do it. Please go ahead. Take the mic. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Please go ahead. Give me your name, please. My name is... Elias. 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 Elijah. Okay. Or Elisha. Go ahead. Do you not know uh, that you are the that you are uh, the temple? That you are the temple of God, uh, that the spirit of God dwells in you. If if anyone uh, he dwells in, in the temple of God, God is God will destroy him. For the uh, temple. Uh, for the temple of God is holy. Which you are, which temple you are. Okay. Very good. Good job. Good job. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Okay. Take the mic and please say it. Please give your name and then say. My name is Kushbu. Uh, by I beseech you, therefore, you brethren, brethren, uh, that you. Uh, by the, by mercies, the mercies of God, God. Uh, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Acceptable to God. To God, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. And. And do not do be, not be conformed to this world, but by be transformed by the renewing of your mind, uh, that you may know the uh, the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, good. Anybody else? Romans twelve. Second Timothy. Second Timothy. What did we say? Second. Second. Which one was that? Second Timothy three twelve, Pastor. Huh? Oh, Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. Okay, uh, you know you memorize the verse. Say it. Uh, anyone who wants to, uh, anyone who wants to live uh, that all to Christ. Is in uh, anyone who lives godly in Christ is in will trouble big uh, a lot trouble will suffer persecution. I don't know which which version. Yeah, it's, I, I uh, guess it's a different version. Deviance, I think. So. Okay. Anyway, all right. But thanks for trying. Okay, no problem. Um, all right. Let's do. One of our old verses, uh, Ephesians 1, 3 and 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and? Which you already said one verse. Somebody else? 
visions one three okay go ahead take the mic please go ahead um it's echoing a lot so Okay, why don't you go ahead. Just give your name, please, and um, go ahead. Uh, blessed be the, uh, blessed the Lord, uh, go, uh, Lord, and God of our God and Father, are uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, who has blessed, is blessed Bless us. us. Is, 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 with is, is every spiritual blessing, blessing will place in, in Christ in heavenly places in, in heavenly, heavenly places in Christ mm. uh, just as chosen in him before, before the foundation of, of the, the world, world that and we should be is that we should be holy and without blame in uh, before him before him in love in him. love in love very good. all right good job first 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 corinthians 6 9 to 11. please go ahead do, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, nor be deceived, nor um, no fornicators, no idolaters, no adulterers, no sodomites, no thieves, uh, no levelers, no extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are justified, sanctified, but are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and, and by this, hmm. by the uh, by the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit of our God. Very good. Let's give a good hand. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Thank you. All right. Let's um, go to our class now. Let's go to our lecture notes. Thank you, everyone. We'll continue memorizing scripture. I'll check again next week. So please revise all the verses. We'll, uh, we will uh, pick up any, any verse. All right, let's go to section five, lesson number 43. Now, this is a very important section. Sorry? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, oh, under 42. Okay, yes. Some common questions. And I also realize last week somebody had asked a question uh okay all right that's good where did we stop we're drinking food offered to idols okay so food offered to idols uh we do not partake in food offered to idols as an act of worship towards the idol um but you know whatever is sold in the market we pray over it eat it we're not afraid in the market, they may have done their whatever, but we buy it, we eat it, cook it, or you go to the restaurant to eat it. But we don't partake of food offered to idols as an act of worship. Um, so there are all these things. Uh, think about jewelry. So the two passages that generally are used in reference to jewelry are First Timothy chapter two, and also First Peter chapter three. Uh, where Paul says, he writes, he says, let it not be the outward adorning, uh, but let it, uh, this is First Peter 3, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, uh, which 
in the sight of God is of great value. It's great. Thing. But when you look at these two passages, he's not saying that women should not wear jewelry. Right? That's not the conclusion he's making. Uh, because, example, in First Peter chapter three, he, he points to Sarah as an example. Then you say, okay, you go and look up Sarah. You read in Genesis, uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis twenty nine, I think it is, uh, uh, where when Abraham sent his servant Eliezer to find a bride for Isaac. You find that Sarah sent him with a lot of jewelry, bangles, all kinds of things. That means Sarah herself wore a lot of jewelry, and she sent a lot of jewelry with Eliezer saying, when you find a bride for Isaac, you give her all this jewelry. So simple question. Did Sarah wear jewelry? She wore lots. She wore so much so that she even had lots to give to Rebecca and sent it with Eliezer, right? So First Peter 3 is pointing to Sarah and saying, hey, look, Sarah's the example, but Sarah wore a lot of jewelry. So the issue in the matter in First Timothy chapter 2 and also in First Peter chapter 3 is not telling women don't wear jewelry. It's saying don't focus on this. Focus on the ungodliness. Focus on the purity of your heart. Let that come forth, right? You wear what you want. You know, uh, we're not dictating what you should wear. You wear, you make your choice. Some people wear no jewelry, good for you. Some people wear a lot of jewelry, be happy. That's your choice. It's, you know, but the focus is you be a godly person, right? Some people don't wear any jewelry, but they're terrible people, right? Some people wear a lot of jewelry and they're wonderful people. So it's not about the jewelry that determines who you are, it's your heart that determines who you are. Right, so that's the focus, right? And uh, you, we leave the choice to you, and also we respect other people's choices. Uh, I've been uh, in times past uh, uh, when I was invited to preach. Uh, one time I was invited to preach in a church, and I didn't know this before going. I went there, and uh, I was just wearing, you know, my shirt and trouser, and I was wearing a belt, regular belt, but it had a buckle that was gold color. It was not gold; it's just gold. <laughs> and they took me aside said, you cannot come inside unless you take out that belt. I said, this is an ordinary belt. It's not gold. <laughs> no, but it is gold color. So you have to keep it outside. And I'm the main preacher. <laughs> I said, okay, if that's what they want, I will respect it. Doesn't matter for me. So before entering the church building, at the back, I took out my belt, left it there, went inside, preached, full day, came out, wore my belt. Went. <laughs> so I did like that for three days, just to make them happy. But it never changed who I was, right? Uh, it is just their custom. It is, you know, uh, certain Pentecostal churches, uh, they don't believe in it. It's okay, it's fine. If that's, I respect that. If they don't want to have their gold, and this wasn't gold, it was just gold color. And they're afraid of gold color also, it's fine. It doesn't matter to me. I'll respect their tradition. But the most imp more important thing is the word of God, right? The ministry. So, I'll, so, so those kinds of we don't fight over these things because these things don't matter. Right? So I just wanted to uh point that out. Yeah. What about? Uh, yeah. Okay, so in, in, in the Indian custom, uh, people wear bindi. Now, um, again, I, I think the, the most important thing is what is the reasoning behind it, right? If somebody's wearing it just, you know, like they wear makeup, that's their choice. But if they're wearing it out of a religious thing, right, that, oh, this is, you know, Shiva's third eye or whatever, I don't know, or, or some people wear it as a sign of being married or something, right? Some places they wear it as a sign of being married. So it really depends on what it means in that culture or what it means to that person. If you put, if somebody's wearing it as a sign of I'm married, that's okay. Uh, like just like how in some parts of India, 
you cover your head as a sign of being married. That's okay. Because, yeah, the person is married in that culture. You cover your head to show that you're married. It's fine. Uh, in some cultures, you put it there to show that you're married. It's fine. It's not like some big sin or anything. Um, because the Bible doesn't say anything about that, right? So that's why you make a wise choice. But if it's an act of worship, if it's a religious thing, then we don't do it. Right? So it all depends on the person who's doing it. Why are you doing it? You know, and uh, yeah. So, like, suppose um, I uh, talk with someone who don't like to wear jewelries, and in their family they don't wear jewelries. And if, uh, like, they told me that why you are wearing jewelries, why you are letting your family wear wearing jewelries, it is not from Bible. It is, it is like it is not biblical and all. And if they are very close one in my family, then how can I explain that thing? Not in an argument, but in a pleasant way. Yeah. So you can ask, so if they say it's not biblical, that statement is wrong, right? Because the Bible is not saying that. You know, if you can go from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and uh, there's a lot of gold in heaven. The streets are paved with gold. The entrance of the gates are pearl. Lots of precious stones, rubies in heaven. So if God didn't like it, he wouldn't have, have it in heaven. But anyway, so how do you do it? You say, okay, are you willing? Uh, are you okay if I explain to you? And then you explain to them. But on what things? Like how can we... Explain systematically. Yeah, so we have to go to these two passages. First Timothy chapter 2 and so First Peter 3. These are the only two passages in the New Testament that people will use to say that women must not wear jewelry. Right? So you just go to these two passages and you read it and you say, okay, let's see what he's saying. And uh, we will explain this, these two passages in detail in our course on hermeneutics where we talk about interpreting scripture. We'll read it and explain it. But these are the only two passages. You go to First Peter, First Timothy chapter two, First Peter chapter three, and you read it and you explain it and say it's you know he's not saying don't wear it, he's saying the focus should be on godliness. That's it. Yeah. If they don't, it's fine. You can disagree and still be friends. You know, somebody likes to eat rice, somebody else likes to eat chapati. You eat what you want, we'll be friends. <laughs> it's okay. Right? This is not like, you know, life and death. It's not uh, salvation and it doesn't determine our salvation. So things like this, you know, um, think about music, uh, movies and music. So like uh, in movies, see the Bible tells us, stay away from all appearance of evil. Right? First Thessalonians 5, uh, I'll give you the exact verse. So we're talking about being sanctified, right? And and when we say sanctified, then uh, it comes down to a lot of these little little things that sometimes people fight over and argue over, and uh, they look at and we judge each other on all of these things. And uh, what I'm trying to just bring our attention to is, you know, sanctification. That purity must be of the heart, and then it shows up in in how we live. Um, First Thessalonians five. And verse, uh, verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Stay away from every form of evil. One minute. Am I sharing my screen? Um, okay. Sorry, I was not sharing my screen. Okay. So uh, we're talking about uh, movies, right? Stay away from all, every form of evil. So definitely, we don't want to be sitting and watching something that's evil, right? So movies in itself is not wrong. But what is in the movie, that is what determines whether the movie is good or bad, right? Uh, and so, you know, for example, uh, you know, when television came out, everybody was writing on television, this is the work of the devil and all of that. Same thing they did when internet came out. Internet is the work of the devil. 
But just think about how we have been using television for preaching the gospel. Think about how we have been using the internet for preaching the gospel, right? So we shouldn't just assume something is bad. It's the content that determines the so movies, television, internet, these are just tools. These are just mediums through which we communicate. But it's the content that determines whether something is good or bad. So in movies, we have good movies. We have Christian movies. And we have secular movies that are neutral, that are documentaries. Uh, you know, there are movies on, uh, you know, on, on geography, on history, on so many subjects uh, that, are, that are educational. They're not, there's nothing evil in it. It's, it's learning. So obviously we can watch all those things. It's learning, it's good. It's sometimes just recreation. But if it's a movie that has bad content, then that's when you say, I will not watch it. And in fact, one of the best examples is think about the Jesus film. It's a movie. It was made by people. It's that one film that is translated into the most number of languages in the whole world. And that one film has brought millions of people to faith in Jesus. What is it? It's a movie. But it's the movie of the life of Jesus. And some people, they may not fully understand when they hear a preaching, but when they see that movie, their life is touched. They understand about Jesus. And especially when it is in their own language. So has God used movies? Yeah. So movies in itself is not wrong. It's what is in the movie that we say is right or wrong, right? Same thing with music. There is uh, music that helps you worship God. We use music to worship God. Uh, we use music that may be neutral. That means it's not bad. It's not evil. It's talking about life or it's talking about something general. That's okay if you want. I, I don't personally listen to it. But if you want, somebody wants to learn, especially people when they go to music school are learning, you know, instruments and all that, they learn those kinds of things. It's okay. It's not making you sin. It's neutral. You have some classical pieces and all of those things. But it's when this music and the words are evil or they are of a religious in nature, then you have to be careful. Right? So we don't throw out all music. No, there's music that we use in worship in church then there is music that's neutral it's not from church it's secular but it's neutral and then there is music that is actually evil so we have to differentiate all of that are you understanding and you make up your own mind you make up your choice if you say i will not listen to any music fine your choice if you say i will listen only to christian music church music fine that's your choice but there will be some musicians who will when they go to music school, they have to learn different things. Okay. Right? How you, what you choose, that's your choice. We shouldn't judge each other. You know, judge each other and say, oh, that person is sinning because he or she is listening to secular music. It may be just neutral. There's nothing bad in it. It's talking about the sun and the moon and the stars and the rain. And it's not sinful. It's God's creation. So we don't judge them. Right? So... That's about music. Um, obviously, now another question would be participating in religious festivals. Um, again, here it is. How do we? There is no, you know, set thing in scripture. The most important thing is this. The most important thing is we need to maintain friendships with people in order to bring them to Jesus, right? And a good example is First Corinthians chapter nine. You read about the heart of the Apostle Paul, right? He said, to the Jew, I became like a Jew. To those who are not Jews, I became like them. To those who are under the law, I became like that. Those who are without the law, I became like that. That means he's stepping into people's worlds. He says, I become all things to all men that I might by all means gain some. But he's very careful. He says, when I become without the law, yet I'm still under the law of Christ. That means 
I'm going outside of the law, but I'm still remaining in submission to Jesus. And I'm doing this so that I can win people to Jesus. And then in chapter 10, he says, you know, 10 verse 30 and 31, he says, I give no offense to anyone that I might, that I might win some to Christ. I, you know, you can look at these verses, First Corinthians. I'll just give you the exact verse, we'll read it. Just to look at the heart of the Apostle Paul. First Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, look at what Paul says. For though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win them more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. And he, he says that, uh, later on in verse 22, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. See, that's Paul, how he's reaching people. And then in chapter 10, the other scripture that we reference, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, um, verse, we can read verse 31 to 33, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So what is Paul doing? In his relationships with people, his main goal is, I have to win them to Jesus. Right? So when, when, you're, when friends or some people you know, they invite you, can you come for this festival, come for that festival? You have to think, how is this going to affect them? How is this going to affect my relationship with them? And will this help me to point them to Jesus? You know? So if they call you for a birthday party, they call you for house dedication, they call you for a wedding, they call you for something, and let's say they're non-Christian, of course they're going to do it in their way. They're going to have their puja, they're going to have all of that. But it's a wedding. You're not going there to do the puja. It's a friend's wedding. Of course, they get married doing the puja. But you're going because of the friendship. It's their house. It's the house, their house. Of course, they will do the dedication in their way. But it's a friend. Right? So you make your choice. If you want to go, you go. If you don't want to go, don't go. But the question I want, I want, want you to think about is, how is this going to affect my relationship? And can I draw them to faith in Jesus? That's what you have to think. So if you go, your friend will be happy. Right? You're not going there to worship. You're not going to do the puja. You're going there because you're celebrating that they have a house or they got married or you know something like that. But if he's calling you to saying, I'm doing some puja, then you say, okay, you do your puja, I'm, I will come day after. <laughs> I'll, come, I'll come the next day. That means you're, you're, now you're not participating in that worship. So there's a difference, right? How, what you're celebrating, what you say yes to, what you say no to. This is how I would look at it. But if you have a different opinion, that's fine. It's your opinion, and uh, you do what you're convinced about. But the point that I want us to look at from Paul's example is his motivation was, I don't want to offend anybody because I want to win them for Jesus. But I will not compromise my relationship with Jesus. That is very clear. And how you're going to live it out is up to you. You make your decision. But don't judge somebody else. If you see me go to a Hindu's house, Hindu person's house because they're doing house dedication. Don't think I'm going to do worship there. I'm going there because he's a friend. If you see me going to a Hindu person's wedding, don't think I'm going to worship there. I'm going there because he's my friend. And I want that relationship. And I want to be able to share Jesus with them. Right? So don't judge somebody else. 
you make up your own mind and you judge yourself. That's it. Okay, question. Uh, pasta, what, what is, what, what is uh, being chilled? Um, one minute. There are two people speaking, so let's take turns. Um, okay, let's take turns. No. <clears throat> okay, Excuse we'll me? take... Okay, let's... Oh, okay, go ahead. Julia, Juliana, go ahead. Sorry? Juliana, what was your question? What is the meaning of puja? Uh, okay, I, I, I'm not sure if I got your question correctly, but when we say puja, we are talking about the rituals that people do to worship their gods and goddesses. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I used... Thank you. Pastor, what about Second Corinthians chapter six, fourteen to eighteen? Yeah, so that's Second Corinthians six, right? Paul is talking about our our association with people, right? And so he's saying, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Okay. So I'm not being unequally yoked with them. That means I'm not. I'm having. I'm being friends. But I'm not joining with them. So when you think about being yoked, just as a picture, you think about, say, two animals, like, say, two cows. You put a yoke on them, right? So now the two cows are yoked together. That means they're going to be doing the same thing. So I'm not doing the same thing. I'm not yoked together with them, right? I'm only having a friendship, only being a friend. I'm only having a relationship, which we all, in any case, have. We all have friends who are not Christians, who are not believers. And as a friend, you know, I might attend his wedding or I might attend his whatever, house dedication or something, some sort of birthday party, whatever. But because he's a not Christian, he may do some his thing. But I'm not participating in it. So I'm not being yoked together with them. So that's the main thing when we are coming together with them, then it's wrong. If I join with him in his idol worship, that is obviously wrong. But I'm not doing that. I'm only going there as a friend because I want to be able to share Jesus with him and point him to Jesus. Right? So if you look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, what did he do? And this is one accusation against Jesus. The Pharisees came to the disciples and said, Hey, your master is sitting with sinners and publicans. He's eating with them. So think about Jesus. He went and he sat with the sinners and publicans, ordinary uh, you know, publicans, people who were, they were looked down upon. And he, had, he ate with them. But then they were accusing him. How come he's sitting and eating with sinners? One time a woman came and she broke the alabaster box, wiped his feet with the hair and all, and they said, if that, this man is a prophet, he will know that this woman is a sinner who's touching him. How come he's letting this one? But Jesus knew the thoughts of the heart. He didn't say, you know, don't touch me. He said, what she has done, will never be forgotten. See, that is how Jesus was, right? But the religious leaders were finding fault. How come he's allowing somebody like this to touch him? How come he's sitting and eating with sinners? Right? So that's the example Jesus said. He reached out to people. But he didn't condemn them. and uh, But he didn't join with them in their Deeds. So it was not unequally yoked together. Light didn't join with darkness. Okay, so that's Second Corinthians six. Okay, um, let's try to finish this fast because I need to get into the next lesson. What were the other things? Um, yeah, a couple of other things. One was science. There's genetics. 
uh, there's tattoos, there's technology, and so on. Okay, so um, well, we'll talk about these things, uh, some of these things again in our course on hermeneutics. So in, in, in science, uh, for example, people are doing research, the genetics. Genetics, they are going down and you're modifying the genes. So that's a big, a big question. Are we allowed to do it or not? You know, because now you're, you're tampering with the very, uh, the, the nature of a person, the, 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 the very code that dictates his, that person's whole life. But the reason they do it, on one side, you can do it, is because you can treat some diseases through, uh, through those kinds of therapies. So that is one side. But the question is, are we trying to be like God? Because we are actually modifying the genes, which dictates the whole person. So there's, that's an, a big question. And again, we have to make up our own minds. Uh, and if we disagree on how we look at it, it's OK. But my thought is, as long as we are doing it for good, to heal a sickness, to heal a disease, or to help a person, that is fine. But if you're trying to create something new, we have to be careful. Now, if we, we can use it in, in, a, in a positive way, it is good. For example, um, in agriculture, we have genetically modified crops. So there they modify the genes to help the crop produce, maybe uh, uh, to, to, to survive in difficult weather conditions or to be able to produce, you know, like bigger, fruit, big, bigger fruits and vegetables and things like that. So they modify it a little bit in order to increase production. Right? So that's already happening. And some of us may be eating GMO. Uh, fruits and vegetables has been modified, but you're enjoying it because somebody has done research and then it's gone to the to the farm, the field, and they, they do those things. Uh, if it's being done in a, in a way that is for the benefit of people, it's okay. But if you're doing it some, in a way that could be dangerous, we should stay out of it. And that's a big area where people are trying to have discussion. You know, what is right? What is wrong? And it's going on. Um, tattoos. Uh, again, I, I didn't give the scriptures here, but basically, uh, to summarize, in the Old Testament, God warned his people not to put marks on their body or put piercings in their body because the heathen nations, they were doing it in order as a, as a way of worshipping gods. Okay, So that's the reason God told his people not to put those marks, and uh, marks, tattoos, piercings on their bodies. The reason was don't do it because you're, the heathen nations also do it as an act of worship. There's nothing mentioned in the New Testament. Now, when you come in the New Testament, when you come, say, in today's church, think about different scenarios. Uh, first of all, we know that our body is God's temple. We need to treat it with respect. A, a tattoo necessarily is not destroying your body. It's a mark. It's a design on your body, and somebody can put a cross, a dove, a lamb, a lion, or a Bible verse, whatever they want, they can tattoo on their body. So what is it right or wrong? Is it sin or not sin? Now, the New Testament doesn't say anything about it. And like I mentioned, the Old Testament has a context. It has to do with worshiping gods and goddesses. So obviously, we're not putting tattoos to worship any god or goddess. Um, so in the New Testament, uh, we just leave it to the individual's choice. You want to have tattoo, you have tattoo. I'm not having any tattoo. You want to have a tattoo, I won't judge you, and you don't judge me. Finish. But think about scenarios like this. Think about a person who's not a believer. He gets tattoos all over his body. After that, he gets saved. He can't take off the tattoo. Are we going to condemn him? Are we going to say, you can't preach? What if God has called him to be a preacher? He'll come, he'll stand here, he's got tattoos everywhere. But that he did before. So it's not whether he has tattoos or not. It's what God has done in his heart that matters. Right? So the point is, don't judge somebody if they have a tattoo or they don't have a tattoo. Don't judge them. The New Testament doesn't specifically say anything about it. 
the Old Testament says about it, but it has a context. And if we enforce that, we'd enforce everything else that is said in the Old Testament, which we don't do. So in the New Testament, don't judge somebody else. If they want to do it, it's up to them. What if a, can a believer go and get a tattoo? If he wants to spend money and get it, it's fine. It's up to him. I won't judge him. Are you okay? Right? Um, if you don't want to agree with me, that's fine. Not a big issue. Question. Uh, Pastor, I want to ask if we write a name of someone. Somebody else. Yeah, like our loved ones, like suppose our father, spouse, grandfather, or father name, mother name, anyone. Can we write those things? If you want to write, you write. I mean, if somebody wants to write. But unless until it's not religious, like some other religious or idol idolatry, right? True, true. Yeah. If you do if somebody's doing it as an act of worship, then that's exactly what God said, don't do. Right? That's the old testament. But mostly these days, people don't do it as acts of worship. They do it maybe as some beauty thing or some to say I belong to some group or I whatever, you know, something. Or to remember some event in their life or some person in their life. But sir, I have a question about movies also. Yes. So is this okay to watch horror movies? Like if we are watching horror movies or movies like Bollywood, and Tollywood and like mm. Avengers, there are Suicide Squad, movies like this. See, I think we have to be careful in those kinds of movies because movies are having an effect on us, right? We're learning something or something is happening. So uh, if somebody watches horror movies, it's only causing fear. It's only putting the wrong things in their minds. And that's unnecessary. It's bad. So I would say stay away from that. Now, movies made by different production houses, whether it's Hollywood or Tollywood or, you know, whatever, Hollywood, whatever. Uh, again, it's the content of the movie that we have to ask, right? What is there inside it? They'll tell us, okay, this movie is about this, these are the actors. Okay, is it good or is it bad? If it's just general about life, okay. But if it's something that's bad, it's got unnecessary things, we don't want to put that into our minds, so we stay away from it. Right. Uh, so, for example, the Passion of the Christ was was a was not produced by a Christian uh, house. It was by General, I forget which production house, but the Passion of the Passion. Of the, it was all about Jesus, but it was produced by uh, a secular production house, you know, and it had secular actors in it. But it was it had such impact all over the world. Yeah. And Pastor, uh, one more thing I want to know about the reading. Like I like to read about demonology or demonologist things and I read about demons that, that what demons are what and I like to read about demonolo demonology so how like some people say that you are reading about demons reading about that but I want to read it in a like I want to know about those things was because uh, I have seen those things in my personal life. Yeah. So, so the Bible has a lot to say about demons and demons. So it's in the Bible already, right? And if you read books on demons and demonology, it's fine. It's your learning about it. But we don't want to make that a focus because learning about de more about demons is not going to give us more authority about them. But learning about our authority in Christ is what's going to give us authority over demons, right? So learning about demons is okay in the, in the, to the extent that we understand generally their schemes and how they operate. But we don't want to spend too much time on it. Our focus is not on them. Right? Of course, the Bible teaches us about it. So if you look in the Bible, the Bible is revealing a lot to us about how demons operate, how evil spirits operate. And we can learn a lot. But our focus should be on our authority in Jesus because that's what's going to help us you know, deal with demons. But there's nothing wrong in learning about, uh, you know, reading those books. As long as they are biblical, uh, as long as they are based on the scripture, yeah, that's based fine. Based on a scripture basis. Are yeah, there. that's And fine. one more thing that there are mo horror movies that uh, symbolizes Christianity, that like Christianity took over the things, horror things. So it's like, uh, like there are Conjuring. Conjuring is a horror movie, but in that movie there are, uh, exorcism and mm. the like, mm. talk of Jesus that it's shown that the blood of Christ, blood of Holy Spirit 
Mm. And there are movies are Exorcism of Emily Rose. In that movie also, the, it is shown that about priests and about uh, what God have message, mm. God mm. like God's message. Mm. So movies like that, can we watch the like, horror movies like that just to know, like, like just to for the fun also and just to know something. Yeah, so I haven't, I haven't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, ha I haven't seen any of these, so I don't, I can't say what's in it. But I will leave it to your discretion, right? In the sense that, okay, if it's educative or if it's just recreational and it's not causing fear, if it's not putting fear in you, and it's more like, okay, you want to understand, it's an expression of something that's biblical. It's fine. Example: C.S. Lewis wrote this Screw Tape Letters. Okay, it's a, it's a Christian classic book. And maybe it's also made into movies, but basically his book is, and C.S. Lewis is a Christian author. Um, and then in our contemporary times, we've had other people like Frank Peretti, who's written lots of books. Uh, again, talking about the spiritual world, it's, it's in some way, it's an imagination of what would be happening in the spiritual world. How the devil comes to tempt a Christian. How the devil is operating in the spiritual world. And they write this as novels, like as stories. And some of these things are actually made into movies. Um, and, and, and Christians watch them, right? So, but it's, it's actually unveiling biblical truth, but in a novel way. And there's nothing wrong in it. It's actually educating people, uh, opening them up to understanding about the spirit world. As long as it doesn't cause fear in people. You know, some people may read those books and get scared. You know, but as long as it doesn't cause fear, but it's educational, fine. So that discretion is left to the individual. You decide what, what uh, works. Yeah. But for someone it is fearful. Then better not to, because fear is not from God. And if for me I'm watching, I'm not fear fear of watching those movies. So I can watch. It's up to you. Yeah. Okay. If it doesn't cause fear, then it's okay. And it's you're learning something, it's fine. Right? Um even um um I'm thinking of the other Christian writer, I forget, I'm not getting his name. Uh, John Bunyan uh, on about the Pilgrim's Progress. Right? It's again a Christian classic, but again, just talking about what a, a Christian would go through in life, the temptations he faces, and how the devil would attack and problems. On. But it's it's just it's in a it's in a written in a novel way, but it's biblical truth presented like that. So um, those things are fine. Okay, uh, I know our time is up. I just want to one last question was asked last week by Saubhagya Lakshmi. Uh, can a woman wear anything that pertains to a man? Uh, that's Deuteronomy 22 5. So last week, Saubhagya asked this question. Uh, and um, so, uh, Saubhagya, my response to that is that is in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, God gave that instruction. But we don't enforce it in the New. In the New Testament, we just let people, you know, choose their own dressing, whatever you want. Uh, and in different parts of the world, you know, people dress differently. If you go to Ireland, they wear men wear skirts. It looks very strange to us, but that is their tradition. <laughs> That's how they dress. Uh, so different parts of the world, people dress differently. And so we don't judge them. The biblical truth in the New Testament is modesty and in a way that God is glorified. So that's how we want uh, the general the general principle is dress modestly, dress in a way that glorifies God, dress in a way that uh, shows who you are as a person. That's that's the main principle. Okay, all right. Let's take a break. I will come back and um, I will get into our next lesson after the break. Thanks. <laughs> 